my friend Jeffrey Orridge, Harvard Educated Law School, that's pretty impressive. Uh, U.S. Basketball Association, Dream Team, Reebok, Warner Brothers, Mattel Toys in Canada, Right to Play, CBC, CFL, Canadian Tire, welcome. We're going to go right to the, uh, uh, the questions. Thank you. Uh, so as of recent, the public's trust of charities has fallen since they generally have a lack of knowledge in terms of how they work. Given your experience as CEO and head of global business, business development at Right to Play International, what do you think charities should do to increase public trust? And do you think there should be more regulations around charities? Great. Um, really good question. Thanks for the compliment. I was actually the COO, um, not the CEO, but... Um, you had a great chairman, didn't you? But right yeah, to play. yeah, absolutely. So, that would be me. So I knew Ralph <laughs> from Right to Play. Um, I, I, th I think a couple things are important. Uh, I think the first is transparency. Uh, charities have to continue to be as transparent as possible in terms of what they do, how they do it, and where they really spend their money because people are investing in a charity. It's no longer, the, the paradigm should no longer be a donation, but rather an investment. And people are interested in the return on the investment. So the second thing that charity has to prove is what impact are they making? Are they doing what they say they're going to do? And to what, what degree are they using rigor in terms of monitoring, evaluation, and measurement so they can go back to the donor slash investor and, and, you know, and, and actually verify what the investment has, has been spent on and, and, and why and, and what the results are. So I think as long as they continue to do that, it mitigates their risk um, in terms of uh, reputational risk and it also uh, gives people more confidence in that they are investing in a business. And a charity is still a business um, more than anything else. It's still the business of charity. CSR is an important aspect of all businesses, however not mandatory. Do companies feel pressure to involve themselves in CSR initiatives because of external threats, or is it something that companies feel that they should be, that should be mandatory and enjoy um, and enjoy doing for their business. How does involving in CSR initiatives ultimately benefit the company overall in terms of investing and their reputation? Okay, really good question. I, I think, I can't speak for all companies and I don't know what all companies' motivation is. I can speak for Canadian Tire and other companies that I've been involved with who have had a CSR component. I know they do it out of uh, genuine concern for the community and involvement in the community. Uh, their feeling is they need to support those who support them, and that's why it's important. And CSR is, is, is a really broad term for a lot of things. It can include um, sustainability in terms of the environment. It can include investment in infrastructure. It can include investment in human capital, uh, education, youth, people. So it's a broad term and it encompasses all of that, but I think companies do it genuinely because they have a, a, a vested interest in making sure that they are supporting those who supported them. I think the other aspect of it, which you know, can't be dismissed, is the fact that uh, if you do the research, it indicates that people are more likely to purchase products or engage in a company that does that does have a cause marketing aspect or component. So there is a, a direct business benefit, but I don't think that's, that's the main driver. But of course it helps. The other thing is it helps to, to attract and retain top talent. Because people more and more, especially, pardon the expression, but millennials are looking to engage in companies that they can believe in, that they feel good about going to work for, that are doing things to, to reinvest in, in the community. Not only the community in which they live, but, but the community at large. So, um, so I think that's important. You have been the director on various boards throughout your career in Canada and the US, and you have described yourself as American by birth, Canadian by choice. What major differences have you noticed between working on boards in both countries? Does one country promote diversity amongst board members more than the other? If so, have you noticed the difference in the operation or success of companies with diverse boards? Do you think that having diversity on boards is key to running a successful company? Great question. Um, I can't, once again, I can't really, I think it would be irresponsible of me to comment uh, on boards as a whole, whether it's US versus Canada. 
I think it's situationally dependent. Um, I will say that diversity as a whole uh, yields great, great benefits because you have diversity of thought based on diversity of experience. So whenever you're able to bring different viewpoints into play to discuss and debate, to inform decision making, you're better off for it. And uh, no matter how much people think they can relate to a situation or a circumstance, unless you've actually lived it, um, I don't think that, that, that you're really connected. But with that kind of connectivity and understanding um, a perspective and, and seeing things from a certain prism, you're able to contribute to the conversation. So definitely, I think more diversity is needed. We're, we're far from where we ought to be, um, whether it's in, the Canada, in Canada or the US. Uh, I think that the kind of uh, interaction and, and dynamic that's created by different points of view uh, always serves the company well. Uh, Mr. Orridge, Bill C-25 has requirements for some CBCA co corporations to report their diversity representation on boards. However, this is currently limited to gender diversity only at this time. Some feel that this restriction is not comprehensive of the diversity that should be seen. For example, that it doesn't include minorities and persons of color. Do you feel that a robust definition of diversity should be found and should be implemented instead of the current gender-based version? I think that a more comprehensive um, viewpoint towards diversity would be beneficial. And I think it should include um, those groups that have historically either been disenfranchised or uh, grossly underrepresented. So yes, I would definitely in endorse that because once again, it speaks to diversity of thought and diversity of experience, uh, adding to more uh, informed discussion, debate, and decision making. And at the end of the day, whatever organization you're with, you wanna find the best solution as quickly as possible and, and identify those critical pathways to make those decisions. And the bigger brains that you have in the organization, the better off you're gonna be. And it's not based on a quota system, it's based on a talent system. And it really should be based on meritocracy. You know, if you're qualified, then you should get the opportunity to participate on a board or at a high level corporation in a decision making capacity. In an interview with the Globe and Mail, you stated that you knew you were going to be, you weren't going to be a corporate lawyer on Wall Street for the rest of your life, though your parents emphasized and understood the importance of education in one's life. After attending Harvard for law school and working for Rogers and Wells in 1986, it wasn't long until you began to fulfill your passion for sports in your career, where you landed a position in 1991 with USA Basketball. How has your experience in law school and working in a law firm benefited your ability to grow in the sports industry? And would you agree that acquiring a degree in law gives you more of an advantage in pursuing your career related to sports? Yes. <laughs> That's the right answer as well. Okay. So um, I, I, think, I think I benefited immeasurably from going to law school. Um, not so much that I learned the law, but it was a way of thinking and it honed critical thinking skills. And it also, uh, there's a certain amount of discipline, academic discipline that you need to get through law school um, and, and, and to, to graduate. So I think, you know, tenacity, uh, persistence, diligence, um, challenges, overcoming challenges, because there are plenty of times um, throughout my academic career when I didn't necessarily know that I was gonna make it or that I was going to do well. And I don't know who said, you know, 97% of our self-talk is negative self-talk, but I'm pretty sure that uh, they were 97% accurate when they said that. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, there, there are those challenges. But once you overcome that, um, I think that, you know, a legal training prepares you for just about anything. So I'm somewhat biased because I'm a lawyer, but, uh, but I think it, it teaches you a way of thinking and examining problems. And I think any company that you work for is interested in you helping them to solve problems. So if you're a problem solver, um, then you're going to benefit. And it allowed me to, to it gave me a, a platform and a springboard to pursue the things that I was really interested in, which, you know, my passion was sport. Uh, so I was able to get in, in, involved in sport. And my passion was also deal making. So I could do both. 
and actually make a living out of it. So yeah, I, I would encourage people to, to pursue law, but not just law, but any postgraduate degree um, that you think would better prepare you just for critical thinking in life. You tell a story every year about when you were practicing at the big law firm as an associate. Coffee, right? Yes. Serving that's... coffee. Okay, so, um, so I worked for Rogers and Wells, getting out of Harvard Law School, and back then in, in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, um, as not probably unlike now, it's very regimented, right? It's a very conservative environment. And, uh, and there were not many visible minorities. As a matter of fact, I was only the second one, I believe, in the history of Rogers and Wells. And uh, so I'm a first year associate and I'm working on this deal for about six months. And it's a revolving credit facility. And, uh, and so it's just phone con contact at this point. Uh, the clients show up for the closing at our offices and uh, and I walk in and I say hello to everyone and I go over to the coffee um, pot and, uh, and a gentleman who's in there, who's uh, I guess the, the uh, opposing counsel, says, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have a cup, thank you. So I pour him a cup. And then the other two gentlemen stand there pensively, anxiously waiting for me to pour them a cup of coffee. I really don't think that much about it, and the way I was raised is, you know, you're going to be gracious and courteous, and if I'm there, I'm gonna pour the coffee, so I do so. Um, and they sit back down, and I said, okay, gentlemen, I, I think we're ready to begin. They said, well, we're waiting for Mr. Orange. <laughs> so I'm wearing a Brooks Brothers suit. <laughs> it's blue pinstripe with not inch and a quarter cuffs, but inch and a half cuffs, <laughs> and suspenders, and a bow tie, <laughs> right? So I am fitting the exact uniform, right? And my briefcase is there that says J-L-O, <laughs> and it's sitting on top of the, on top of the, the boardroom table. So the, um, the realization I had at that moment is sometimes it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you went to school. It doesn't matter how bright you are. You are going to be cast in a certain light until you actually have to make it clear who you are and what you're about. And that you can never ever define yourself by what other people think of you or how they perceive you or how they see you can't define yourself by where you went to school, what kind of car you drive, where you live, who your friends are, but define yourself by who you know you are. As the 13th commissioner of the CFL with extensive experience in the sports industry, you have been very successful in your career. Aside from your very successful moments in your career, can you describe a time where you experienced a difficult decision to make or where you felt you failed and how you overcame this experience? Have you ever had to make a tough decision that may have gone against your core values? Uh, really good question. Um, I think that there are constant challenges in business. Um, you're always making tough decisions. Uh, I, I really do believe that, uh, that you, you are not um, compensated for your technical ability. When you reach a certain level, you're compensated for the amount of stress that you've got to bear, right? Because it comes down to decision making. And, uh, and most times, there's, it's it, very seldom it's, it's, it's black or white, right? There are always shades of gray. And whatever decision you make is going to be hailed by some group and criticized by another. And I think it, it's, it was no more um, emphasized or exaggerated or poignant than when I was in the position of CFL commissioner. Because every day you're faced with, with challenging decisions. Um, I think that, uh, the dis some of the decisions that I made um, to institute an anti-tampering policy among coaches, um, to preserve the integrity of the league, um, to change the drug testing policy to give it more teeth and more of a deterrent uh, aspect to it, and to send the message to youth 
that performance enhancing drugs and cheating is, is not acceptable. Uh, the, the fact that I marched in the first uh, pride parade and was a, a visible and, and, uh, and very um, vocal advocate for the LGBTQ community, um, those are decisions that not everyone um, embraces. And those are decisions that are, in a way, a brand decisions for the organization that I was representing as commissioner. Um, those were the things that I had the luxury of standing tall for and, uh, and supporting. Um, but it wasn't without controversy and, uh, and it wasn't without detractors. I have been in positions sometimes where I have been asked or almost required to make decisions that went against my core values and beliefs and I refused to do so and I was subject to the consequences. So when you're in that position, you have to make sure that you are aware of the consequences and that you are willing to sustain whatever those consequences may be, right? And it's, there are plenty of people who, look, in the 1968 Olympics, um, <laughs> I was barely born then, but, but I know the story, so um, in the Mexico 1968 Olympics, uh, there was a track and field team that the U.S. had. And, uh, and the winners of the 200 meter uh, race, the, the winner and the, and the third place person, um, uh, John Carlos and, and, uh, and Tommy Lee or something? Smith. Tommy Smith. Right, Tommy yes. Smith, John yeah. Carlos. So when they approached the podium, and went up to hear the uh, U.S. National Anthem, they bowed their heads and they raised their fists with a black glove. That's a very famous picture that, that has transcended generations and decades, right? Some people perceived it as a black power salute. They um, were wearing badges for human rights solidarity, right? That's what they were promoting, and, uh, and it was not without consequence. It was very controversial. The second place, the silver medalist from Australia also banded with them in a show of solidarity because he wore the same badge, right? And he went back to Australia and talked about human rights. Um, but obviously it had repercussions for those two gentlemen. Um, they didn't get the endorsement uh, deals. They, they weren't welcomed back with with, with, with open arms. Um, it probably damaged their career. You look just recently, Colin Kaepernick can't get a job in the, in, in the NFL. And statistically, he is certainly among the top quarterbacks in the league, but he's not employed. The question is, is it because of his silent protest that, you know, that he's not employed? Is it because he has started a movement that is perceived by some to be antithetical to what the NFL stands for and revenue and viewership and brand reputation and recognition. So it's not without consequence. You just have to be prepared to accept it. And I have. But at the end of the day, I think I'm better for it. My kids certainly respect me. My wife still loves me. My parents think they raised the right, right kid. And, you know, and I get a chance to come here and sit in your class with Ralph Lean and to talk about these things. So, you know, what, val what great value is that? You know, I've literally, I, I get scared every time Ralph invites me because I've had a different job every time I've come to speak. <laughs> um, so either I can't keep a job or people recognize that I'm really good at what I do and they want to have me. So regardless of what my value system is. You have been a prominent figure in both American and Canadian sporting leagues and, and specifically the Olympics. In 1991, you were the business and legal affairs at USA Basketball and have had many diverse roles in the sport marketing as well as legal governance. <laughs> Currently, the Canadian Tire Corporation partnered with architect firm Sid Lee to build the Canadian Olympic House. It is evident you have a passion for sports and an innate understanding of their governance. My question to you is, what was the difference in philosophy that caused you to step down as a commissioner from the CFL? Wow. So, 
I really enjoy this class because the, the, the preface that, and the prologue that you have leading up to each question where you, you tell me how great I am, that's really cool. I love that. I'm gonna take you guys home. You need to talk to my kids. Let them know that, you know, your dad. Anyway, um, so I, I'm sure you can understand that I can't get into the details of, of the difference in philosophy, but suffice it to say that, you know, I was hired to, to do four things, at least. You know, my strategy was increase the relevance of the CFL, um, develop deeper relationships with our with our partners and and our and our customers, consumers, clients, uh, fans. Um, so it was reach. It was relevance, um, and that would lead to revenue. Um, so those were kind of the pillars that that I went after. Um, I'm, as I said before, I'm very proud of, of the successes even in the two years that, that we had. From a social standpoint, I was, um, I championed a, a policy for violence against women. It was the first policy in, in major, major league sports. Um, now it's very popular, you know, the Me Too um, movement. But, but I did that two years ago, three years ago now. Um, as I said, you know, you have a, you have a collection of nine team owners, and then each team, not only do they have the owners, but they have a governor system. So they have a lead governor, and they have an alternate governor, which is usually a president. So nine teams, but you have 27 board members. So oftentimes you're going to have a difference of viewpoint among 27 people and the commissioner who really, the commissioner represents management, right? Um, they're governance and I'm management. So um, oftentimes you, you, you don't have full alignment because there are many diverse viewpoints in the room on what the direction uh, should be. But it was my mandate to chart the direction of the league, um, to recognize uh, where we needed um, some help, um, to find solutions to the aging demographic, to the fact that um, the CFL uh, has many health and safety issues, um, including concussions, um, to address the fact that youth participation is falling off uh, in football, not just in Canada, but, but the US as well. The fact that wages in the CFL uh, are not nearly what, what they are at, at the NFL or, or any other uh, major professional sports league. So there are all those challenges that you have to tackle. And I had a certain point of view on, on how we should address each one of them. And they didn't always align with, uh, with owners and, and so that happens sometimes. And so a question was asked a little earlier, are you ever put in the position where you are asked to make choices or decisions that may not be uh, consistent with your core values. CEO salaries are on the rise, widening the gap between the rich and the poor. According to the Canadian Centre for, Pol for Policy Alternatives annual report on executive pay in Canada, it would take a worker a month to accumulate an hour's earning for the poorest, um, for the poorest of the top 100 CEOs in Canada. Can you shed some insight on why the work of executives can be deserving of such dramatically inflated compensation? And is their salary an honest reflection of the work required of their position? Wow. wow. A little shaky yeah. asking that again. Okay. Right. Really good question. You know what? I think it's, I, once again, I think it's situationally dependent. You know, it's, I, I don't think you can say, you know, blanket all CEOs, whether or not the compensation is commensurate with their level of responsibility or what they, what they bring to the, the corporation. Um, I will say that, that there are some CEOs that, in my experience, are, are more valuable than others um, and probably do deserve the compensation that they're getting because of the value that they contribute to, to the corporation and the level of responsibility that they have. I mentioned before, you know, a lot of it has to do with, um, with responsibility and decision making and the stress that comes with it and the fact that whatever decision you make 
can have a dramatic impact on the fortunes of that company, which means the fortunes of the employees. You make the wrong decision, the company goes bankrupt, there's a bunch of people that you are responsible for, whether it's 10 people or 10,000 people, you're responsible for them being able to make a living, right? That's a tremendous amount of, of um, it can be a burden, right? When you think about how to structure your organization, and you think about people's lives. It's not just a manager position. It's not just a vice president title. It's a person that you're dealing with. So, you know, so I, I think that you get compensated for the level of, of responsibility you have. The widening gap, you know, I did some research on this years ago, and I'm not really up to speed on it, um, and I don't know why there is, you know, the, the salaries have become so, uh, wildly um, disparate between um, even you know regular management versus the compensation of a CEO. I really don't know. I can't comment on that. Um, but I do know that there is a tremendous disparity, and the same way that you know, quite frankly, I can't. I don't know what the rationale is behind paying a professional basketball player. $30 million a year to play a game where there are teachers who are responsible for the well-being, the benefit, and the education of, of our youth that provide the fuel for our future, and they're making $30,000 a year. I don't get that either. So, you know, the value of a professional athlete, because it's an entertainment value, and because there are media rights involved, and there's no media rights for a teacher? I don't know, tell me. So you were the 13th commissioner of the Canadian Football League. As commissioner, there is a lot of pressure to make the right decisions and have the right priorities. Priorities might be to gain popularity with the people, keep team owners happy, recruit younger fans, or try to find balance for a league that has been described as standing in the middle between being a big boy professional league and quaint provincial enterprise. My question to you is, when you were the commissioner of the league, what was your biggest priority and how did you go about determining that? Um, <sighs> I think there are three major priorities. Um, health and safety is always, always paramount. Um, not just from a human interest standpoint, but from a business standpoint. You wanna have your stars playing as long as possible. People pay to watch, people pay for performance. So you wanna have your athletes performing at their best. So you wanna make sure they're, they're, they're healthy. Um, you wanna ensure their safety. You want to increase their longevity in terms of their career. So that's important. I think the other thing that's important, obviously, is revenue and how to drive revenue. And that's not only getting um, fans in and, and people paying tickets, uh, but, but really transitioning ultimately from a service-oriented um, business to an IP-oriented business paradigm. So you want to ultimately derive much more money from your intellectual property rights because you can monetize that through me all forms of media, um, whether it's traditional broadcast or, or, or streaming, anything that's traditional or non-traditional, um, as opposed to selling, selling out stadiums. I mean, obviously ticket sales are important, um, but with the CFL, uh, if your average capacity is, let's say, 25,000 seats, uh, you can sell out every stadium in every game and still not necessarily keep pace with, um, with economic demands and, and, and financial demands. So growing, growing the game and, and growing revenue is important um, next to health and safety of, of, uh, of the individuals. And then the other thing is just making sure that you're relevant. Right? You have to make changes to make sure that, that you stay relevant um, with, with, with your customer, your consumer, with your fan base, uh, and do those things. We, we started creating our own content internally, in-house. Um, we started uh, really focusing on social media as, as that next communication and delivery platform. So there, there are things like that. You've gotta stay innovative, right? So innovation was important. 
health and safety, innovation, and, and revenue. So the esports industry is a rapidly growing industry that is gathering a lot of attention across the globe. Uh, given the glo growing number of viewers and rising profits, esports are becoming increasingly interesting for event organizers, sports leagues, sponsors, and traditional sports clubs that are establishing their own esports divisions. In fact, it was reported in the global esports uh, audience that the global esports audience reached 385. 0.5 million viewers in 2017, and it is expected that the uh, number of viewers will go to 589 million in 2020. Uh, the global revenue amounted to 696 million in 2017, and experts re estimate this amount will increase to approximately 1.49 billion by 2020. Uh, my question for you is where do you see the esports in e industry growing over the next few years and how do you feel that brands such as the CFL or N NHL will embrace this rapidly growing market? Great question. Um, I think that, that traditional sports teams, um, it's, it's sports leagues, it's a major competitor now uh, where it wasn't even at, at its inception. I think that um, what it provides is what everybody's looking for, relevance among the younger demographic. Well, it's no, it's no mystery that, uh, that people are consuming sports in a totally different way, um, and now there's actually a new sport um, that is going to compete and going to continue to compete with traditional sports. I think that in order to stay relevant, in order to expand their reach, in order to deepen their relationships with their, with their fan base or consumers at large, uh, in order to uh, find other streams of revenue that traditional sports um, has to figure out some way to be more connected and associated with eSport. And I know that there are personal investments um, that various owners of, uh, of, of professional sports teams are making in eSports. Um, there's, there's an impetus towards um, figuring out uh, a different business paradigm to be involved in eSport. Um, but yeah, it, it's growing, it's gonna continue to grow. And, uh, and I'm not saying that one day it's going to replace those traditional sports, but it certainly has carved out it's, I don't think it can any longer be considered niche. Um, it, it's real and it's relevant. So articles have been published about how the CFL pays players poorly. There is cri criticism circulating pertaining to players' salaries, bonuses, and overall compensation. Many individuals are as a result discouraged from playing in the CFL, especially due to the high injury rate in football. As someone who has had heavy involvement with the CFL as a commissioner chair. What can you say about this? Do you believe more can be done in terms of player compensation to promote recruitment? And if not, why? That's a good question. I think you have to look at the overall economy of the CFL. How much revenue do they derive versus their expenses? And I think there always has to be a balance, right? Um, with the NFL, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's an unfair comparison because the amount of money that they generate just from their media rights deals, uh, not only in the U.S., which has a population more than 10 times that of Canada, but also globally, the fact that they've been able to expand like that um, is dramatic. So I think you just have to look at, at, at the business and what is sustainable. I think the salaries are currently what's sustainable at, at the CFL based on the other expenses and based on the size. It's a nine-team league, and, uh, and there are certain price points that the CFL has to maintain in order for, for it to still be relatively affordable as a major sporting event. So, you know, if you grow the pie, then there's more to distribute. Uh, in terms of players being discouraged from joining the CFL, CFL op provides an opportunity for uh, young men to pursue their dream of continuing to play football and earning a living from it, uh, no matter what the wages are, right? And it's a choice that people make. And sometimes they say, you know what? I will sacrifice going into another line of work because I want to play, I want to continue to play professional football for as long as I can. And, uh, and they understand the risks and they understand the the, the salary structure and the, and the level of compensation. 
Um, I know that to certainly that, that the union's job, just like every union, is to try to increase salary and benefits um, for, the, for, their, for, for their membership. Um, and I think they're striving to do that, but you know, you've got to increase the overall revenue pie in order to pay um, your workers more money. It's just like any other business. During your, your time as commissioner at the CFL, CFL unveiled a comprehensive new policy on violence against women. You quoted it to be history changing and stated that doing nothing is never an option. In April of 2017, a CFL player was charged with four criminal offenses involving two female victims. On March of 2018, nearly one year later, the CFL finally voided his contract with the BC Lions, however, provided no comment on the incident. It, it, it appears as if the policy has failed the victims and is doing nothing in this case. What do you think should have been done in this situation and what would you have handled and how would you have handled the situation if you were still the commissioner? Really difficult question, right? Because I'm not the commissioner anymore. I, um, I actually announced that I was leaving my role uh, I think it was April 10th or April 11th, um, and that I would be staying on until the end of June um, to help with the transition. So I, I think it's a, it's a more complicated situation than has been reported. Um, I, I believe that this individual had been uh, under investigation um, when the incident first occurred, which was before that person was charged and the incident had happened sometime, you've done the research, but I think it was October or November prior. Um, and so that, that the investigation took a while um, before the individual was charged. Now, once the individual is charged, what is the, what's the uh, information mechanism as well? Now, is that widely reported to, um, to, to the, the, the public at large? Does anybody send a communique to the CFL office? Is that person's, um, the team that they're with, uh, are they notified? Not necessarily. And given the fact that it was the off season in April, there may have been some more complications just in terms of, of information dissemination. Uh, but I really can't comment on that. I, I don't know. Um, I do know as commissioner, uh, I do know what I did do when I was there, we had a situation with Justin Cox, who um, uh, was uh, was was uh, part of an incident, uh, domestic violence in Saskatchewan, um, and immediately um, he was suspended uh, from the league um, under my auspices. Um, I had that authority to do so because, under a certain article in the in the bylaws and constitution, the commissioner. Um, can make a decision on anything that would bring the league into disrepute. And so I exercise my authority under that provision in, in the bylaws and constitution. Um, I would do the same thing. You know, I, I've done the same thing. Um, you know, Justin Cox wasn't the only situation where um, I took immediate and swift action when it came to um, domestic violence or the, uh, or the implication of of, of wrongdoing when it came to violence against women. And that wasn't really, you know, I, I, I'm lauded with, <clears throat> with being a major protagonist in terms of pushing the, the, the policy through, but it was started, the whole impetus behind this was started by several of our club, the BC Lions and the Edmonton Eskimos um, first started promoting um, a, a, uh, an advocacy for violence against women. So I just picked up you know, the mantle on, on what the clubs were doing and I said, you know what, this needs to be league wide. We have an obligation and a responsibility as a, uh, as a professional sports league that has the megaphone and the platform um, to do something that is socially conscious and socially progressive and the right thing to do. And I said, you know, regardless of the detractors, history will catch up and prove that we've done the right thing. So my question is, uh, the CFL is facing a 200 million class action lawsuit over chronic traumatic encephalitis 
encephalopathy. I don't know if I'm correct. Uh, or CT, <laughs> just call it CT. CT, there we go. <laughs> CT is a progressive disease that is formed when someone has multiple head injuries or concussions. Due to the findings of a court case in the United States, the NFL admit, admitted that there is a link between concussions and CTE, yet the CL CLF um, denies any link. The result of a study conducted in Boston on the brains of former football players suggested that out of 202 players, 177 players showed evidence uh, of CTE. There were also eight uh, CFL players, out of which seven players showed evidence of CTE. As a former commissioner of CFL, you received criticism regarding your statement about no links between football players and CTE. After looking at the new evidence, do you still believe there is no link between football concussions and CTE? If so, please explain your reasoning behind this. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, I think that I have to take issue with a couple of the, um, a couple of the facts that you purported. The first fact is that the NFL, check this, did not ever admit that there's a link between concussions and CTE. What they did do is they orchestrated a settlement with the Players Association. There was an NFL official who in a congressional, I think a congressional forum, um, said that he believed that there may be a link. And that was what was widely reported. I also believe the NFL never verified that and never um, and never uh, offered to substantiate what the member of their executive team had, had actually purported. So that's number one. There was a settlement, but I don't think there was ever an admission of, of a linkage. Uh, that's the first fact. The second fact is I never said that there was no link. What I did say when the question was posed to me was I responded saying, look, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a professional. But from the information that I've received from the British Journal of, uh, on, uh, the British Journal of Medicine um, and a study that was just conducted um, and uh, debated in Berlin, October of the previous year, um, the evidence suggests that it is inconclusive from the scientific community. There are people that, in the scientific and medical community, that are still out on this. That there's, there's one camp that says, you know what? There's no conclusive evidence, more research is necessary. There's another camp that says, well, what more evidence do you need? Based on the research that we've done, we are able, we feel very uh, sound in concluding that there's a direct linkage. And all I did was report on the fact that it is not, it is not unilaterally agreed upon within the scientific and medical community that there's a direct link. And I was just, you know, I, I, was, I was reiterating the narrative that was given to me in terms of what had been reported by the, the, the forum in Berlin and also the British Journal uh, of, of Medicine. So, so that's the second thing. Um, in response to what we know now, there's more information coming out every day. There's more research being done every day. Um, there are people who believe that there are contributing factors to CTE. Um, there is one case, at least one documented case, where there had been no history of this person ever having a concussion, ever but there was evidence of CTE in the autopsy. There's also um, some medical evidence that CTE, that, that the enzyme of CTE, those traces are found in most people over the age of 14 years old, right? So whether it develops into something else or not, so all that research is currently being done and they're uh, contrary to popular um, media reports, um, there are still people in the scientific and medical community who are not quite um, sanguine in the belief that there's a direct linkage. One follow-up. Look, concussions are bad, right? You get hit in the head, it's bad stuff, right? Bad things happen, right, with concussions. 
Um, we, we know football is an inherently um, violent sport. Concussions happen outside of football. Concussions happen in youth soccer, gymnastics, cheerleading. Concussions happen all the time. I think the important thing is that we focus on not only preventative measures, but also proper diagnostics, quick diagnostics, and then follow-up treatment. That's what's important. And that's why I think the, the, the conversation that's continuing to happen about CTE is really valuable. So, you know, look, I, concussions are bad. And good people have bad things happen to them. And they get hurt. And football is one of those things where, you know, head-to-head -head combat contact is happening all the time. So much more prevalent than in other sports. As an NFL fan, I've followed the NFL throughout my whole life and I've always wondered what the point of the CFL was. Do you think it's possible for the NFL to purchase the CFL as a developmental league similar to the XFL or the NCAA as an alternative for NFL prospects to still remain in football? You know what? I, I wouldn't rule out. Um, I wouldn't rule out any possibility in terms of sport. You you never know what can happen. I mean, we saw um, back. You know, when when I was watching basketball, when I first started watching basketball, there was a, a league called the ABA, the American Basketball mm -hmm. Association, and uh, and somehow they merged with the NBA. Um, so and and now you have you know the 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 expansion and the growth that the NBA wanted by consolidation of one league. Um, I think the idea, what I had heard is, you know, there were some people who thought the XFL, um, or actually the USFL was created um, in the hopes of being bought out ultimately by the NFL. Um, there are spring leagues that, that are purportedly popping up for, for uh, football um, in, in the states. So I think there's still an appetite for professional football um, in any area um, on, on several different continents, whether it's Canada or, or the US. The third largest football playing community is in Germany. Um, is there a possibility of games being played, re, the, reignite, the reignition of uh, the European Football League or, or some possibility of that with the NFL? Um, I think anything is possible. Who would have thought 30 years ago that the NFL would be exporting football to Europe? So, you know, I wouldn't rule out any possibility. Um, I think that the CFL is in a unique position because it is truly quintessentially Canadian. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a, that's a unique value proposition and selling point. However, in the same token, it's only a nine-team league. And because of economies and, and revenue streams, it is somewhat limited in terms of, of its potential growth. Okay, on behalf of Ryerson and the students, Ted Rogers School, I want to thank you again for coming. And for that. Thank you. Thank you.